Um, this is a IPS webinar series, Progressive Politics in the Time of Pandemic. Um, we, it's a series, we have a series going on, and this is, I think, the third, the third of all the, the series that we have going on. Please check them out. They're gonna be taking place every Thursday until they run out. We have, I think, five more after this one, or is it four more? Four more after this one. Um, and uh, you can go to, to get more information. In fact, I'll put it in the chat. The website to go to is ips-dc.org slash events. Um, and you can see all the, all the various, um, the various uh, topics that we have for the webinars. Uh, this one is uh, COVID, modernity, life ways, and drug use. Uh, we will be uh, 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 have a presentation by IPS fellow uh, and my colleague Sanho Tree. Um, I, uh, Sanho has been the, is the director of IPS's drug policy project and has been so since 1998. He's a former military and diplomatic historian. Um, his current his current work encompasses the reform of both international and domestic drug policies by promoting alternatives to the failed abolitionist model. Pro, I'm sorry, not abolitionist, the prohibition, <laughs> prohibitionist <too>. model. <laughs> um, and um, and the just to go through really quickly a couple of the uh, other things that we have coming up in the series every uh, at 11:30 each Thursday. Um, we, the next one is the July 9th power plunder and pandemic and protests and how fossil, it'll be about how fossil fuel interests are taking advantage of our current crisis and what we can do to stop them, a part of the, the series. And then we have a borders in moments of crisis, a conversation on how COVID-19 is impacting immigrant, immigrant communities and how the climate crisis is being used as a pretext by the U.S. Uh, to militarize the borders and restrict the well-being of the undocumented people. So we have on July 23rd, coronavirus authoritarianism in the far right, a webinar on the uh, power grabs by Donald Trump, uh, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, and Viktor Orban and others, and how these are, uh, how, how these far right accelerationists uh, have mobilized on the streets um, and then we, the last one that we have is why we need to save the post office. That's July 30th, a session explaining why we need to save the postal service from an immediate uh, threat and support innovations like postal banking. Um, and, uh, and so this, that's the series. Of, um, and we try to make these as multimedia as possible, multimedia presentations. It's required that you register. So each one, when you go to the page, will have a link for registration. Um, and yeah, and so, and all of them will be presented by, uh, IPS experts. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Sanho. We're going to hear about, uh, COVID modernity, life ways, and drug, drug use. Thank you, Sanho. Thank you, Netva, and welcome to everyone. Good morning or whatever it is in your time zone. We have people from the Philippines and everywhere else in the world, it seems, uh, this morning. Uh, this is going to be, a, a not my usual kind of talk, it's more wide ranging and uh, uh, there's nothing quite like uh, having your, your life and your world come to a crashing halt for several months to really ponder um, the meanings of, of, of life ways and modernity and, and how we got to be here and what is normal. And uh, so I wanna talk about drugs from that perspective. Uh, and I'm gonna do so by uh, talking about a number of, of different stories, vignettes that will, uh, at the very end, I will tie together. And if I fail to do so, please remind me. But uh, one of the reasons drug policy has been so baffling uh, and so difficult to, to reform and, and to, to fix um, is that we don't really uh, situate the problem uh, properly historically, but also uh, it is one of the most interdisciplinary problems I've ever studied. And uh, I used to be a World War II historian, right? And World War II was pretty inter interdisciplinary. It was very, very complicated. Uh, but it, there was a lot of clarity in terms of who the good guys and bad guys, quote unquote, were. Uh, and uh, so it, 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 when you talk about drugs, however, you're talking about an incredible supply chain that affects millions of people around the world from uh, peasant farmers to uh, 
mules to traffickers to dealers to money launderers uh, to uh, all these different uh, uh, people. And, uh, and so you have to know a little bit about each of these things to get the big picture. And the big picture is, is hard to explain to policymakers because uh, our drug war establishment, both in terms of the bureaucracies involved, but also the congressional committees that do oversight and appropriations for these things, as well as the universities that train uh, these bureaucrats uh, and other academics are, are very much, uh, as well as the, uh, you know, the, the journalists who cover this. They're also you know, beat journalists or they specialize in certain aspects of this. Uh, but there are so many different silos that it's difficult to uh, get a top-down overview. And when you begin to do that, the whole thing starts to look quite insane, right? And so uh, what I want to do is try to break down some of those silos and, and talk about uh, how we got here. Um, and as a historian, I'm going to talk about the past first before I talk about the present. Uh, and so, you know, whose job is it to, to make sense of all these different things? Um, it's not the drug czar's job, uh, it's a, because we put that office in the White House and we politicized the, the, uh, the, the National uh, uh, Office of Drug Policy Control. It's situated in the White House, so, so it's become a partisan issue as well. Um, but let me start by telling you a story about, uh, about how we got here in this hemisphere. Let's start with the basics. Um, about uh, 15 years ago or so, I was asked to give a talk at uh, Boulder High School. Um, and it's a, kind of an alternative uh, high school in, in the sense that the students looked at your bio and uh, they looked at the different things you've done and then they come up with a title for your talk and you have to speak to it. Uh, and so these high school students, being teenagers, uh, came up with a rather unique title for me to, to speak to. It was about sex, drugs, and international relations. And I thought, oh Lord, how am I gonna tie all these things together? Um, and it, of course, dawned on me at the last minute how to bring it together. And if you ask the question, well, how did we end up here in this hemisphere, the Western hemisphere, uh, most of us who are non-indigenous? Um, and it actually has to do with, uh, comes back to drugs. Um, when Columbus went you know, sailing across the ocean, uh, what, was, what was his purpose? What was his objective? Why, why did he do that, undertaking this very risky voyage? Um, it wasn't just uh, gold and, and the search for lands and, and you, know, uh, uh, you know, Christian crusaders. Primarily it was for spices, right? And so why spices? Why were spices so valuable back then? Uh, it wasn't just because the food in Europe was uh, bland and boring, which it was pretty much at the time. Uh, but uh, each of these new spices, um, whether it's cinnamon or clove or nutmeg or any of these things, whatever it's new and exotic, it came from somewhere else. And this is how we think about drugs in our society, right? Drugs are what other cultures do. They're foreign, they're alien. And, and we imbue these substances uh, with all kinds of alien properties uh, we imagine uh, they're associated with. And back in the day, when Columbus went looking for these spices, these drugs, these new drugs, uh, had a word of mouth reputation. Um, they were thought of as drugs uh, because uh, all these exotic new spices were thought to, you know, um, how do I put this delicately? Put lead in your pencil, right? Uh, it was the Viagra of the day. Uh, and of course, uh, aphrodisiacs are mostly working the head anyway. Uh, and so people were willing to pay a lot of money for these things. And uh, so I guess you could make the argument that half the world got colonized because a bunch of old white men in Europe couldn't get it up. And thus, kids, you have the <laughs> linkage of sex, drugs, and international relations. Uh, I'm being facetious here, but, the, but you get my point. That these things have uh, deep roots. And if you take a look at the past 500 years of colonization and development in this Western hemisphere, uh, it becomes apparent just how profound um, the role of drugs and, and what are thought to be perceived as drugs at the time, uh, what the role they played in the development of this hemisphere. In fact, for a good 400 years of that first period, uh, they drove the development in many ways of this hemisphere. When we're talking about crops like, uh, uh, you know, uh, sugar, where we get rum from, uh, sugar was an incredibly valuable commodity, uh, and sugar is a drug. Um, if you don't believe me, try giving it up for two weeks. Uh, uh, and at the time of the uh, uh, American Revolution, 
the island of Barbados was worth more to the British Empire than the 13 colonies in North America, simply because of, of the profitability of sugar uh, and, of course, rum that came along with it. But also things like coffee, uh, tea, tobacco, uh, and spices. Just take tobacco, right? Uh, what would the United States look like today? Uh, what would Virginia or North Carolina or Kentucky look like today if we never had tobacco? Um, that was the backbone of, of, of uh, much of the economy in the early years uh, of these colonies. Um, and uh, sugar, uh, you know, is a horrendous uh, commodity. Um, if you look at what it took to produce that sugar, and by that I mean it took enslavement, so that Europeans went to an entirely different continent to kidnap and enslave uh, Africans to come and work on plantations in the New World to generate these, these profits that, that, that made these European empires very, very wealthy and created some of the banking fortunes uh, that played a role later on in history. But uh, the conditions in, in uh, 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 sugar plantations in the Caribbean uh, were just off the charts horrific compared to, uh, well, there's no point in comparing pain and suffering, but it was an order of magnitude different. And, 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 uh, and so throughout this history, uh, drugs or thought, things that were perceived to be drugs played a big role in, in how we got here and how we live our lives today and who has power, who has land uh, and access to capital. Um, much of this is passed on generationally. Uh, so if you're, uh, if you're talking about Black Lives Matter today, a lot of that uh, is, is, is generational wealth that was never passed along because it was stolen from uh, people of color, particularly African uh, Americans. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and all this comes back later on in the drug policy. We'll get to that. Um, but so I just want to give you a sense of, of, of some of the time scales we're talking about here. Um, I will talk a little bit about my own uh, uh, background. I'm a Chinese American. I was born in Taiwan and came to this country at the age of four. But my father uh, and my mother were from mainland China and uh, they left and, and moved to Taiwan, uh, fled to Taiwan in 1949 during the revolution. But a few years ago, uh, about a dozen years or so, my father uh, went back to our ancestral village in China and he uh, brought back a digital copy of our family scrolls, the family tree, so to speak, no, no pun intended. Uh, and I knew it went back a few generations. I had no idea. I was not prepared for how far it went back. Um, and we believe, uh, it, it's hard to read some of the old script and they use a different calendar system, but we believe it goes back at least 26 generations, approximately to the year 637, give or take. Um, and when I think about all of those generations that came before me and the lives that they led, um, and I don't want to romanticize it because to be a, a, and they were peasant farmers in rural China, right? And to be a peasant farmer in rural China was not easy, uh, especially if you're a woman in, in rural China um, as a peasant. But their life ways were very predictable and sustainable over many generations. Um, each, you know, and, and when I think about the last generation, uh, my generation, um, I live a life that is completely alien to all of those, uh, all of my ancestors that came before me. The energy resources I consume uh, probably exceed all the energy resources my ancestors have ever used, simply because I live a modern lifestyle. I've traveled a lot. Um, the food that I eat comes from halfway around the world very often. Uh, we have a very globalized world that uh, my ancestors could never have envisioned, much less learned to navigate. Um, and navigating this new reality is very, very, very important. Um, but in, in China, uh, uh, it's not unusual to have these long family trees because it's Confucian society. Uh, and not to romanticize Confucius either, but uh, it was a, uh, Confucius laid down a formula for a super stable society, too stable in many ways. And that's why China suffered for, for so long. Uh, but uh, it was predictable and sustainable. Um, and we've since gotten rid of that, uh, particularly during the Cultural Revolution in China. And we haven't really replaced it with new values and new ways of, of living and being and understanding our roles in this world. Right? Uh, and this is a the theme I'll come back to over and over again. Um, and so that's kind of uh, uh, you know, my, my family background. Um, but let's take a look at more recent history. Uh, let's look at some commodities, for instance. Uh, corn. 
a uh, simple commodity. What's, this got, what's corn got to do with drugs other than corn alcohol? Well, uh, back in the mid 90s, uh, there was a big uh, uh, debate over NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. It was ultimately passed. A lot of us warned uh, a lot of the downfalls, uh, pitfalls of, of that agreement. But it was passed. And the technocrats, however, who, who engineered this uh, free trade agreement in uh, Mexico City and Ottawa and Washington, D.C., very often they basically, uh, their shoes uh, never got dirty, right? They, 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 they live and work in marble buildings. Uh, and, and these technocrats just thought, well, uh, let's talk about efficiency. We fetishize the efficiency. And uh, Americans said, look, we can produce corn on an industrial scale in the Midwest through mechanized industrial agriculture, uh, big agribusiness, and we can ship that corn uh, to Mexico, thereby freeing up your farmers uh, and your labor pool in Mexico can then develop. Uh, with uh, industrialization, et cetera, et cetera. These technocrats, however, uh, I don't think really understood what they were tampering with, uh, the life waste they were tampering with. So if you look at just one commodity of corn uh, and how that played a role in anchoring uh, rural Mexican agrarian life for so many generations, uh, including pre-Columbian times, right? Corn was so central to people's life ways. It was a gift from the gods. It was uh, your, your, your songs, your rituals, your holidays, your festivals, your feasts, um, all revolved around the planting cycle. And, uh, and that kind of you know, kept the community together. It gave them a uh, purpose and understanding of their role in the world and how to navigate that. And suddenly, uh, we flood that society with cheap uh, North American corn uh, from the United States. And suddenly, these people are torn asunder from the land uh, and the crop that kept them rooted and stable for so many generations. And they were thrust into a, a many of them, uh, and I'm oversimplifying this argument of, uh, for the sake of argument, uh, just as an illustration. This is not a direct line, and I'm not saying everyone went through this experience, but many of those people uh, were suddenly torn asunder from the land uh, that had given them you know, stability for, for so long, and thrust into a brand new reality of concrete, steel, petroleum, silicon, uh, into an urban life way, uh, very often in the maquiladoras, the, the sweatshops, the factories along the border areas, uh, and, and, and other sources of employment. But suddenly you have rural people migrating to urban areas. And the technocrats never ask themselves, how are we going, who's going to teach them how to raise children in this new environment? Who's going to teach the next generation what kind of values, songs, traditions uh, that would root the next generation? Our, our life ways are evolving so quickly now that um, one generation doesn't understand what the next generation is going through. And that's always been a complaint, right? You can go back to Socrates complaining about the young. But this, in these days, we, we, we've moved that evolution up to warp speed. Um, and it's, it's always been hard to raise children under any circumstances, but now especially, right? Because parents really don't know what uh, the new technologies and the new environments uh, that, that young people are going through. And so suddenly you've got this migration of, of rural people into, uh, in, into an urban reality they don't know how to navigate. Both parents uh, very often are working now. Who's going to raise the children? What songs will they teach them? What values? What traditions? What, uh, you know, and, 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 and with both parents working, what are the influences on this next generation? And, and, and unfortunately, if you're at the bottom of an exclusionary society, uh, in the ways that you know, urban folk have always kind of looked down on rural folk. Um, you know, city mouse, country mouse. You know, you've heard the fables uh, forever. Um, but suddenly, these kids don't have a a, gu a guide uh, to teach them how to navigate this new reality, and they're often excluded from a lot of things. But who's offering them a ticket out? Uh, and here's where the drugs come in. A lot of times, the gangs uh, and the narcos will offer them um, instant respect if you have a gun. Uh, you've got social mobility, you've got cash for the first time. Um, you can date people, you can go out, and you can do all these things um, rather than work uh, as your uh, parents did in sweatshops. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, we have this inexhaustible reservoir, it seems, of, 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 of people who would rather live as a, as, a, as a king for a couple of years than as a pauper for 70 years. Um, and attention must be paid to such people, right? 
Um, so this is a, a boomerang that took a quarter century to come back and, and, and hit us. But Mexico, uh, since President Calderon waged, launched his disastrous drug war back in 2006, uh, by you know taking the beginnings of a turf war and uh, uh, and just beating the hornet's nest to the point where now there are hundreds of thousands of deaths as a result of that policy, uh, over 200,000 at least, and they stopped counting a long time ago because it's too hard to disaggregate who was killed over common crime versus drug crime versus all these other things, etc. But uh, but there's a tremendous price to be paid for these kinds of things. Now, there are also other factors in terms of Mexico being a transit country and, and producing as well, uh, uh, you know, heroin and other things, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I just want to give you one slice of that to, fit, to ponder about life ways and, and modernity and what that means for us. Um, so that uh, life ways, um, again, come back to, to, to haunt us. Uh, when I began working in drug policy uh, 20, two years ago now. Um, I uh, started out in, uh, uh, in, in, in Baltimore. A lot of the urban neighborhoods you saw in the wire uh, or the corner, um, those were the neighborhoods that, that I was working in and looking at the uh, demand side of the problem. That's how I started in this field. Uh, and I would come across communities that were um, bombed out, these row houses. You know, uh, most of them on a block were, were empty. Very often the, the roofs have collapsed. You can see the sun shining right down to the living room. Um, and yet uh, people were living there. And the only functioning economy were illicit economies, um, very often involving drugs. And um, I remember seeing politicians come to these neighborhoods and saying, ah, I see what your problem is. You've got drugs. We'll give you police and prosecutors and we'll take care of these bad people uh, and then things will be better again. Um, that's not going to work, right? And it didn't work. And there, that's not an acceptable substitute for building a healthy society. And, and so the neglect that uh, has festered for so long um, has been brewing. Um, and a lot of these politicians were, I mean, some of them were, were progressive politicians uh, and members of the Congressional Black Caucus who today are quite progressive on this issue. But back then, 20, 25 years ago, it was a very uh, formulaic response very often, uh, more, more police and prosecutors. Um, but these are people for whom tomorrow would not be a better day. Um, they truly believe that their best days are behind them. Uh, and so they engaged in these illicit economies. They didn't have uh, access to jobs or to job training programs or to the transportation infrastructure in Baltimore that would take them to the suburbs where some jobs resided uh, because the infrastructure was all designed to bring suburbanites into the city. Uh, so they're going the wrong direction for, the, for those kinds of jobs. And so our politicians' response to these people uh, was to send in more prosecutors, more police, uh, as though security was the main issue. And they basically said to them, you need to be sober and have no job and no hope and no future and no opportunity. Uh, that's not going to work, right? Uh, and so we, we've come full circle in many ways. Um, we now have to reckon with the life ways that have been so disrupted and destroyed over so many generations. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you, a, I'm going to see if I can share a, uh, some slides with you here. Hold on for a second. Um, let's see. So this is a, a quote from uh, Robert F. Kennedy from 1965. I was stunned when I first found this quote in the archives. Uh, but, you know, this is what he told Congress uh, back then. Uh, 1965. Uh, you know, he, he, he had been to Harlem and been to other parts uh, of the country to look at what was called the narcotics problem at the time. And he said, now, more than at any other time in our history, the addict is a product of society which has moved faster and further than has allowed him to go. A society which in its complexity and its increasing material comfort has left him behind. In taking up the use of drugs, the addict is merely exhibiting the outermost aspects of a deep-seated alienation from the society of a combination of personal problems having both psychological and sociological aspects. The fact that addiction is bound up with the hardcore of the worst problems confronting us socially makes it discouraging at the outset to talk about solving it. Because solving it really means solving poverty and broken homes and racial discrimination, inadequate education, slums and unemployment. Um, 
it's, it's a haunting quote, uh, and Congress, of course, ignored it, and we went down the road to the drug war. And we've been doing this now for, for decades. All of my lifetime, we spent more than a, tr a trillion and a half dollars on this problem. Drugs are winning. Um, but it's, it's, the drug war, though, has, has, has been a form of scapegoating, scapegoating a complex, these complex problems that, that R.K. talked about. And he does oversimplify it a bit, but, but, but I think it's a good, uh, you know, a, a good quote that captures a lot of these aspects. And they scapegoat it. Uh, and I want to show you the next slide from uh, my friend, Professor Craig Reiterman, uh, Professor Emeritus at, at UC Santa Cruz, where he talks about uh, the, the function of drugs. He says, drugs are richly functional scapegoats. They provide elites with fig leaves to place over the unsightly social ills that are endemic to the social system over which they preside. They provide the public with a restricted aperture of attribution in which only the chemical boogeyman or lone deviant come into view. And the social causes of a cornucopia of complex problems are out of the picture. Uh, so you can see that, uh, you know, throwing more police and prosecutors at this problem uh, isn't going to, uh, to, 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 to solve this problem. Um, And then, in terms of teaching the next generation, um, I'll go back to China for a moment. China, in, in the past uh, few decades, has gone through a tremendous ref uh, process of, of reform and evolution uh, and uh, disruption. There's been an incredible migration from rural to urban. Um, and there's a growing drug problem in China as well. Uh, not only is there a rural to urban migration and no one there to teach them how to navigate this new reality, but there's also been a migration to the virtual that uh, people are so networked now that uh, is a technology that didn't exist just a few years ago. Uh, the last time I went to China, you could spend cash to buy things. Today, you try buying anything in cash in China, it's very, very difficult because everyone has a smartphone and they use instant credit on smartphone. A lot of vendors in the street won't pay cash. Um, and so uh, how how to raise children in this new environment. Uh, particularly a lot of them were, were one child families, uh, which is also very hard to raise children. And, 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 uh, uh, and so I think the, the government of China has much to look forward to in terms of um, uh, problems coming down the line. That traditional life ways uh, have been severed and we've evolved new ones at, at light speed uh, uh, without really giving thought to how they're going to fit in society and, and teach them how to, how, to, how to be in this world. Uh, what is normal anymore, right? And this is what COVID and, and this lockdown has got me thinking about. What is normal and how do we find our place in society? How do we belong? Um, and if, 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 if four months in lockdown hasn't you know, caused you to have some reflection about these things, I don't know what will. Uh, maybe this talk, let's, let's see. Uh, but we look around the world and again, we see this world of, of concrete, steel, petroleum, silicon. Uh, in my artificial background, this is a Stanley Kubrick, uh, is my interior designer from 2001 Space Odyssey. Anyway, uh, this new world of, 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 of uh, concrete, steel, petroleum, silicon, uh, that, um, uh, and we think it's normal. We think it could only have been this way, right? This is how society was meant to evolve. Uh, but this wasn't inevitable. This was a result of choices that we made or failed to make as a society because we privatized and deregulated all these uh, sectors of our economy so that the market now decides for us what's going to, what's going to take place next rather than policymakers. Uh, and the market doesn't really care about your, your children or grandchildren uh, and, and their values and, and their, uh, the environment they're going to inherit. Um, Put it another way, the, the elders of the Iroquois uh, Confederation had a saying. Um, uh, the Iroquois, we also stole uh, in part our, our idea of a constitution in the Iroquois. Um, their elders were very wise and they would uh, ask this very simple question. How will the decisions we take today affect the seventh generation down the line? Um, that's, I think, good long-term thinking, perhaps too long for a lot of people in the West these days. Uh, but, but I think it's a, it's a good way to approach the world. But whose job is it in our society 
to talk about uh, uh, these questions, right? Um, we are, in fact, just making this up as we go along. We're building new life ways uh, without really much thought. Um, put another way, uh, I'm talking to you via an iPad. Uh, I'm very much addicted to my iPhone and, and my Twitter way too much. Uh, but, uh, but, but 20 years ago, uh, did anyone talk to Steve Jobs? Did he ask anyone? Is this a good thing to unleash in the world? Um, I get a lot of benefit from it, but I also see a lot of problems as a result of this and it, that we never thought through initially, right? Uh, and I would, uh, I would even argue that Google and Facebook and, and their subsidiary corporations have done more harm to this planet uh, than Goldman Sachs could ever dream of, um, simply because of uh, what we're stuck with today in terms of Trump, in terms of Nazis, in terms of uh, new realities that are being crafted with QAnon on the internet. Right, people are, are, are going reality shopping on the internet in ways that are, uh, their ancestors could never have dreamt of. 50 years ago, if you were a, a, a neo-Nazi or a John Birch Society member, maybe you got your, your monthly uh, newspaper in the snail mail. Uh, but if you went down to your local bar uh, and started uh, you know, espousing uh, your, your philosophy, you might get punched out fairly quickly. Right? But today, you can go online and find hundreds of thousands of people who will tell you that you're normal, that this is the right way to think, that we've crafted new realities that, are, that have nothing to do with reality anymore. And so as a society, it becomes very difficult to have a, a rational discourse about public policy if we can't agree on what constitutes a baseline for reality. Uh, that's a big problem now. So we have not just Trumpism, but we have Bolsonaro, we have uh, Putin, we have all these things that a lot of this was done through social media, right? It, it was a powerful tool uh, that evolved partly from uh, a lot of these technologies like the iPhone, the iPad, and others. Uh, anyway, we, we really didn't think these through, right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't have these things. I'm just saying that, you know, it'd be nice if we had some, some room uh, to think about these things. Um, and so there's an old African proverb. Uh, that says, the, the last one to recognize the existence of water is the fish, because the fish is swimming through the water, right? And so we are the fish swimming through modernity, and we don't recognize that it's a fact that this is a reality that we created, either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, and we have the power and capacity to change the future trajectory of our society. Uh, but only if we take those decision, that decision-making back uh, from uh, the free market and, and from others who are unelected or, or who care only about short-term uh, uh, objectives. Um, if you look at our, how this intersects with our, our political system and solving complex problems, be it global warming, be it drug policy, we have politicians that think in terms of two, four, or, or six-year election cycles, right? And once you're elected, your first concern is getting reelected. So you don't want to rock the boat too much. Um, so uh, we can't look to them for long-term thinking and long-term solutions. Um, if you dare talk about you know, planning even five years into the future, Fox News will call you a socialist. Uh, our corporations think in terms of quarterly numbers. If you don't make your numbers, your stock will tank. You'll be taken over. You'll no, no longer be extant. And you'll be irrelevant. Right. So whose job is it to look out for the interests of the seventh generation, or even the next generation yet unborn? Uh, we don't have elders in our society the way our ancestors did. Um, they revered elders for a good reason, because they've been on this planet for many, many decades, and they've seen the hubris and the impact of, of, of change um, on their local communities and societies. And so they can see trouble coming from around the corner. Uh, a mile away that uh, in many ways our, our young technocrats don't. And there's a lot of hubris involved. Uh, and the Greeks tried to teach, teach us about that thousands of years ago, but the joke is on us because you don't really get it until you get it. And by the time you get it, it's too late. Put another way, uh, there's an old saying that um, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. In other words, uh, we learn from making mistakes and it's important to, uh, and it's not wrong to make a mistake, but it's important to learn from them, to acknowledge them, uh, and then to evolve. Uh, and so uh, there's, 
the, the intersections of, of, of all these problems, and I think you're beginning to see the complexity of, of, of uh, uh, how drugs fit into this, right? Um, people either turn to these uh, substances through, uh, for, in search of, 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 of solutions or insight, and drugs, particularly uh, hallucinogens or entheogens, uh, are very useful, can be very useful for offering tremendous insight and, and in many ways could help heal our society, but also people who use drugs to escape uh, their reality because they don't feel like they fit into this modernity, this world that they had no role in creating and don't know how to navigate. No one ever bothered teaching them and just thrown into this. Uh, and we're making this up as we go along and we're doing a very bad job of it, I would argue. Um, and so uh, we do a lot of scapegoating now um, with drugs and say, aha, this is the problem. Um, one of the best places to look for that kind of scapegoating, I think today is in the Philippines where President Rodrigo Duterte, who uh, came to office six months before Donald Trump, but in many ways was the, the proto-Trump. Uh, he pioneered a lot of the repressive tactics and scapegoating and, uh, uh, and lock them up strategies. He's actually locked up a lot of his opponents uh, through lawfare, through, through legal harassment. Uh, but he began his campaign, began his uh, campaigning by, by arguing for massive killings in the drug war, which he had done when he was mayor of, of Davao City in, in the Philippines for, for decades. But he wanted to get nationally. And he said he would be glad to kill uh, uh, you know, millions of, of people if that sort of took. Um, by many estimates, he's killed anywhere between 20 to 30,000 people. Uh, no one really knows. It's, it's too hard to investigate these things and the police aren't really interested in getting to the bottom of it. But it was a way of scapegoating a, 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 a profound mix of structural problems uh, and to say to people, um, that's the reason you're, you have problems today is because of those drug users. And if you just get rid of them, things will be wine and roses, things will be great again. Um, scapegoating uh, is a term that comes from the biblical era, right? Where uh, the, the, the ancient priest or the rabbi would literally confess the sins of the village into the, whisper them into the ears of a goat and drive the goat off into the desert. And thus your, your village was ritually cleansed of sins. And this is uh, what Duterte is doing in the Philippines. He's trying to murder people as a way of, of I think, uh, projecting a lot of, of social frustrations and societal ills and saying, just let us have this extermination, exterminationist policy that will make your life better. It won't, and it hasn't. Uh, what Duterte is doing today in terms of the drug war reminds me very much of what uh, uh, the czars did in, in, in 19th century Russia in terms of uh, waging pogroms. I have a pogrom, uh, was a, a, a vicious form of scapegoating against Jews in the 19th century Russia, where uh, they projected all kinds of lies and smears and vicious attacks. And, and it was a way of scapegoating and, and using Jews as, 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 as a pressure valve. It's just unleash holy hell on this group and, and you know, your problems will, 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 will disappear. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, drugs are, are, are a very useful scapegoat. Uh, for, for a lot of societal problems and structural problems that are endemic to, to the social order um, that we live in. Um, and in other places like uh, Colombia, uh, you know, we decided to fight the drug war through source control, uh, through eradication, that uh, we would use spray planes to uh, try to, to, to uh, defoliate our way um, out of this problem. Let me see, I'm going to show you some images here. Um, okay, uh, this goes back to the Philippines, sorry. Um, this is one of the mo most famous uh, assassin killings in the drug war, where gunmen uh, uh, you know, uh, just shoot people. Uh, very often they're on motorcycles um, and they're working with dudes with the police very often uh, to assassinate suspected drug users. Uh, and so this is a famous photograph. It's uh, People call it the Pieta, uh, which President Duterte mocked mercilessly, by the way. Um, but uh, those that were more, quote unquote, lucky were able to turn themselves in and this is what they, they received uh, was basically incarceration uh, and, and uh, some Zumba classes for treatment. So now we get to Colombia, where uh, since uh, for the past uh, over two decades now, the US 
has funded a, a devastating aerial spay, spray program, uh, which got suspended about five years ago because the World Health Organization linked the chemicals to, to the, that we're using, which is a very powerful form of Roundup. They linked that to, uh, to cancer. Uh, and so that was suspended five years ago, uh, but both uh, the Trump administration uh, and the Duque administration in Colombia are trying to restart the, the, the fumigations now, as if we can somehow defoliate our way out of this problem. But again, it's scapegoating um, larger problems onto peasant farmers. It has not worked. Um, they're doing it because they don't have any other alternatives. These are remote areas. Uh, and very often, um, you know, uh, just, just destroying their crops isn't going to uh, solve the problem of, 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 hungry, uh, of hunger, right? Uh, that, that food security, it's something we take for, for granted in the West, well, less so during COVID because people are actually going hungry now. But, uh, but once you destroy their livelihoods, right, these peasant farmers who live on a couple of dollars a day um, are suddenly struck with a problem uh, of food security. How are they gonna feed their families uh, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year? Um, and what's the one crop they know how to grow, which doesn't require a lot of infrastructure to transport, uh, and the buyers will come to their, their farms and pick it up for them, solving that problem. Uh, and that, of course, was, uh, is the illicit crops uh, of coca, primarily. Um, and so uh, they replant, right, because they have food insecurity and because this is the only way they know how to survive. Uh, and so coercion only works, uh, you know, at the, a certain point. Um, you can't coerce people into not being hungry uh, and not feeding their children. Um, coca farmers in Colombia, they're like peasant farmers or farmers anywhere in the world. They will do whatever it takes to feed their children. Uh, you can count on that. Um, and if the only option is to grow more illicit crops, that's what they'll do. Um, this is an example of a, a woman who did exactly what we asked them uh, to do, which is they tore up their coca crops. Uh, they knew the spray program was going to begin soon, and they invested in hearts of palm and peppercorn and other crops. And you can see uh, these are the, the, the hearts of palm, the palmitos that were sprayed uh, about a week before I took this photo, uh, and, and they're dying. Uh, this is the fourth time this woman was sprayed, by the way. Um, but, uh, and this is how the children in the region perceive uh, what's happening to them. Uh, this is a mural from, from La Hormiga in, in Putumayo, Colombia. Uh, and you can see on the top is their vision of before uh, the drug war. Uh, next, uh, the middle is, is during. And then afterwards, uh, the, the destruction that's caused by, by this, this scorched earth policy. Um, and, uh, and so our policymakers had said to these people, you know, you need to stop doing this. Uh, but uh, what are they supposed to do in the meantime? How, how, how are they supposed to live or survive? Because uh, they grow coca, because you can take a, a, a couple of acres of coca bush and convert those leaves into coca paste using basic chemicals. Uh, like gasoline, cement, sulfuric acid, ammonia, and a few other nasty things. You don't need a, a chemistry degree at all to do this. They do this uh, on their farms in, in makeshift shacks very often. Uh, and they'll make a kilo of, uh, or less of coca paste, which is easy to transport. This is a road in Guaviare, Colombia, uh, in the Amazon region. Uh, a major road, by the way. There are thousands of families on the other side of that road, and this is their only way to connect to the rest of the country. So we are asking these people, instead of growing coca, to grow uh, hundreds if not thousands of kilos of fruits and vegetables, to transport on vehicles they do not have, uh, over roads that literally don't exist very often, to sell in markets, both domestic and export, they can't get access to, and even if they could, to then have to compete against uh, agribusiness imports, uh, which are uh, you know, very often subsidized by, uh, by, by respective governments like the United States, against which these peasant farmers um, can't possibly compete. Uh, and so that hasn't been working, right? So uh, if you want to understand the difficulties of, of being a peasant farmer in Colombia today, uh, this, this infrastructure picture uh, will teach you the importance, I think, of, of infrastructure. Uh, and this gets back to the question of the next generation. And, and this is something that's haunted me for, for two decades now. Um, this in 2001, 2002, and put to my Colombia, these kids are holding up crops that had just been sprayed by our, our spray planes, uh, US funded spray planes. And they're holding up food crops that have been destroyed. Uh, and what haunts me 
to this day is that I didn't get their names and, 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 and contact info to trace what happened to them because I thought this can't last you know, for decades, and, and it has, this drug war. Um, and so my question is today, where are these kids? They're adults now. Uh, did they join guerrillas? Did they join the right-wing paramilitary death squads? Did they uh, join the narcos? Did they become uh, join the 7 million internally displaced already in Colombia? Um, or did they go deeper into the Amazon, cut down more rainforests, to plant more coca? Uh, any of these outcomes would be a policy disaster, both for the United States and for Colombia. And yet that is exactly what we've been doing. Right? And so we have to start paying attention uh, to the next generation. Um, and instead we have, uh, you know, stupid leaders who throw tantrums. Uh, and, and offer us very simplistic solutions. Um, a wall, for instance, isn't going to stop anything. Uh, most of the drugs uh, come through legal ports of entry um, in, in vehicles, in hidden compartments, in, in hidden produce. Um, they use narco tunnels, they use uh, narco submersibles, uh, both semi submersibles and fully functioning submarines now, as well as narco torpedoes uh, or, or drug sleds that can be towed. Uh, with a cable, you know, hundreds of meters behind a boat, so that if you're stopped, you, you release the cable and uh, and the drugs float away. But there's a homing beacon on there that tells it to surface every couple of hours and 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 then to transmit encrypted code, so the follow-on ship can pick up the drugs if they get stopped. Uh, so for all these reasons, uh, ultralights and drones that are now being used to smuggle over the wall, the idea of a wall is just patently ridiculous, right? But uh, we have politicians, however probably because of social media, are able to throw out these ridiculous uh, uh, attempts at a solution uh, that, that can't possibly work. Um, and when Trump first proposed this, I thought this will never see the light of day, this will never happen. And then we had the longest government shutdown in history over the question of a wall. Uh, and I'm one of these people who believes that uh, so many of life's lessons can be learned from one episode or another of The Simpsons. They've been on so long. But there's this one episode uh, early on where young Bart Simpson runs for class president. And he begins with an attack speech on his opponent. And he says, my opponent says there are no easy answers. Well, I say he's not looking hard enough. But this, in a nutshell, is the problem with our politics today. It's, it's why Congress is so uh, mired. It's, it's why Fox News is so popular is that people want easy answers. And easy answers are not always the right answers. Uh, they're very often, particularly for, for longstanding problems, are, are, are the wrong answers. Uh, and the solutions to many of our problems, with drugs, with terrorism, with uh, a lot of crime, and a lot of other uh, problems are very often counterintuitive in nature. That is to say the knee-jerk solution is very often the wrong solution and makes things worse. Um, here's a good example of that. This is a finger trap. Um, and uh, it's kind of my calling card when I, when I talk to their legislators or their staff, right? And I give them one of these as, as a souvenir so they remember this lesson. Uh, that, that, that sometimes the most intractable problems have counterintuitive solutions. That the, that the harder you pull, the stucker you get. And it's counterintuitive to think that, well, maybe you need to relax a little bit. And that's how you begin to extract yourself uh, from the situation, right? Uh, and so we need to stop asking questions like, where is Waldo? And start asking, how is Waldo? Um, right? what, it, it, it's, the, it's the health of the society that we need to look at, rather than uh, scapegoating drugs, which are a manifestation of a lot of, a lot of those uh, social and societal ills. Um, and uh, finally, I think I'll, this is the last one, I'll leave you with this image. Um, it's a lesson in scapegoating. This is from the 1998, when I first began working in drug policy. I read uh, the drug czar's National Drug Control Strategy. Uh, at this point, it was General Barry McCaffrey, who was Bill Clinton's drug czar. And uh, an introduction struck me, uh, because I'd just come out of working in World War II history, and I said, this is a really cre pretty creepy language that uh, it sounds like he's scapegoating. And so I did a simple test. I did a search and replace function, um, and I replaced the word drugs with one word, uh, Jews. And uh, you can read it for yourself. Um, take a screenshot if you want. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll also uh, tweet this uh, afterwards. But uh, you can see how easy it is to scapegoat a cornucopia of social uh, and structural ills onto drugs or onto any other scapegoat you, you choose to and project 
uh, all those uh, uh, societal ills on, on, onto that scapegoat and say, just get rid of the get, get rid of the goat. And that's how we solve our problems. Uh, and so uh, that's the image I, I want to leave you with. Um, but then finally, the question to tie this all together, <laughs> you're probably wondering where I'm going with all this, in all these different directions, is that what, is it possible that our level of, of drug use, both, uh, you know, a problematic and, and, and non-problematic drug use, recreational use or, or experimental use, um, or to escape, uh, is a rational and predictable response to a world gone mad. Um, uh, and that's the, the question I want to leave you with um, as you endure your, your lockdowns. Hopefully you're staying at home and wearing a mask and doing all that stuff. But that's something to ponder uh, about the importance of life ways and uh, teaching the next generation how to be in this world, how, to, uh, how they relate to this world, and how they should see themselves and their futures. We need to start talking about that and, and talking about it urgently. That's one of the reasons I work at the Institute for Policy Studies. We are a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary think tank, a link tank, if you will, uh, where you can break down some of these silos because this has a lot to do with uh, development issues, with economics, with politics, with foreign policy, uh, with human rights. Uh, it's not just about drugs or drug policy. Um, and so that's, uh, that's where I want to uh, situate this. Now, we do have time for, for Q&A if anyone wants to. Uh, I think there's an option to type in some questions. Um, let me see if there's anything in the chat room. Um, we, we were asking people to use the Q&A feature. There's actually a separate sort of chat that says Q&A, Q&A next to uh, the chat. And so that way, but not, you know, it doesn't really matter at this point. Before we did it because the chat was so full of so many other things that it helped us distinguish them. So if you have any questions for San Ho, please put them in. It makes it easier put them in the Q&A thing and then we will. And uh, people said sometimes I'm a little, 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 little bit um, depressing. Uh, I want to leave you on a positive note uh, on how to begin to solve some of these problems. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, again, the Bart Simpson problem uh, I talked about uh, earlier, that people want easy answers. Uh, and politicians are loath to uh, get into more complicated answers that are counterintuitive in nature, right? It's always easier to scapegoat and to sling mud uh, and to be, to be Trump than it is uh, to actually solve some of these problems because it takes more time. Um, but it is possible to communicate paradigm shifts um, in a soundbite even um, that, uh, you know, that uh, a lot of politicians are afraid, uh, you know, for the past two decades I've worked on, on, on uh, drug eradication in Colombia and other places, politicians um, offer these kinds of simple solutions, right? We just need to, we know where the drugs are coming from. Uh, and so they, a lot of politicians who might vote otherwise are afraid very often, less so these days because the, 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 the momentum on drug reform is, is, is swinging in our favor, uh, at least in the United States. But it's easy for them to uh, say that, uh, to offer uh, these kinds of, of, of scapegoating solutions. Uh, and they're afraid of a negative attack ad from their opponents, which used to be much more effective than, than it is today. Although in a lot of red states, they still do this very commonly, where in election year, you'll be seeing these ads incessantly for the next few months now. But they're afraid of an ad that might go something like this. Uh, um, our, our, our host or moderator, Netta Freeman, let's, let's say Netta is a, is a member of, a liberal member of Congress, a progressive member, a radical member, who wants to vote against all these things. And it would be easy for me as a right-wing challenger to float an ad that would be very cheap to, to produce and, and cheap to air that goes something like this. Friends, Congressman Freeman doesn't care if your kids are drinking the drugs. He knows where the drugs are coming from. They're coming from Colombia. They're coming from Mexico. They're coming from all these other countries. And you know, he won't approve the aid to go down there and, and, and clean this up. Come on, folks. We all know where the drugs are coming from. Send me to Washington. I'll be tough. I'll approve this aid. We'll go down there and, and kick their asses and we'll solve this problem and I will protect you from drugs and protect your kids from drugs. Uh, that is an incredibly uh, foolish and, 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 and simplistic solution to a very complex problem. Um, and so it's easy to, 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 to air those mudslinging ads over and over and over again 
And Congressman Freeman uh, has to then hope that all the people who saw my smear ad air over and over uh, on, on TV and on radio are going to tune in to the six o'clock news where, uh, or 11 o'clock news, where he's got maybe uh, 60 seconds at most for a soundbite to offer a, a rebuttal to that kind of simplistic argument. It's difficult, but not impossible. Uh, and so here's a way to respond. Say, look, uh, hiring more police and prosecutors and building more prisons to deal with uh, you know, the drug problem is about as effective as digging more graves to solve the international AIDS crisis. It really solves nothing. That, uh, that, that uh, we cannot you know, continue to, to, to uh, uh, fund these kinds of things uh, and, 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 and hope that it will somehow solve the, the, the structural roots of these problems. Uh, so that, uh, that, that, that people need to have a, 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 the view of possibility of a way out of a better life. And so that kind of scapegoating is easy to do, but you could say that, look, you know, more police prosecutors and prisons won't solve this problem. Uh, and uh, that uh, sending guns and helicopters to Colombia isn't gonna solve the problem of poverty in the Andes or the Amazon. And it's certainly not gonna solve uh, the, the problem of addiction in the United States. That these, these strong arm solutions really solve nothing and we need to talk about root causes. So that's a way to get a 60 second sound bite, a bit more than that. Uh, in my rambling, but you can do that. Um, anyway, and there are also uh, legislative uh, procedures that can be used, uh, using anonymous uh, uh, straw polls, etc., to, to break a false consensus. That's a different lecture. Uh, I'll post a link on it on, on, on Twitter, um, where I talk about it on, on C-SPAN and other places. But let's... Uh, you got three questions here. Okay. Let's see. Uh, you want me to read them out loud? You got it. You got Three it. Questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here's one from uh, Doug McVeigh. It was announced this week that the state of Oregon will be voting on a ballot measure this November to decriminalize simple possession of most illegal drugs. Do you support broad decriminalization generally, and do you think it's a measure uh, that could have an impact on broader drug policy debate? Uh, great question, uh, Doug. I absolutely support it. The idea that we would incarcerate people for these problems um, really solves nothing. Uh, and that uh, there's also, a, a, you know, a, an individual liberty, a cognitive liberty aspect to this. Um, I'm not an economic libertarian, but I am a civil libertarian. And in that sense, uh, we give too much power to the state that uh, at a level of control, right? If you look at the, uh, uh, the, 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 the founding, uh, the founders of the nation and the Constitution, where in the Constitution does it give the right to the government? to uh, kick down your bedroom door, to arrest you and throw you into prison for something that you do to your body, absent harm to others. If there's no one else involved, if you grew your own drugs or whatever, uh, and you're only doing it to yourself, uh, where does the state get the right to, to intervene at such an intimate level uh, and to destroy your life, basically, uh, for doing that? Um, that uh, if the state is allowed to do that, we, we, and, and we get the drug war through our mother's milk, right? We get it from birth in our society. Uh, and so we assume these are normal state powers, they're not. Uh, because if the state can intervene at such an intimate level um, into your own corpus, um, what is to stop the state from intervening uh, in terms of sexual freedoms, reproductive rights? Um, you know, if, if, where in the constitution does it give the right to the state, for the state to decide what you do to your lungs, to your mouth, to your stomach, uh, to your brain, to any of your orifices, absent harm to others. Uh, and should they be able to destroy your life uh, as, as a result? If you don't have the sovereignty of your own corpus, you really don't have anything at all. Uh, that's the most intimate and, and basic uh, level. Um, uh, there's a couple, one, because uh, the, the, the one you just picked was the third one. So you want to start yes. in order? The first uh, one was... Let's see, okay, let's see. Um, where does the liberal world order see that? Where does the liberal order, okay, where does the liberal world order uh, led by the United States fit into the problems of humanity today? Uh, would it have been any different if governments didn't pretend to care about people? Uh, I think our, our you know, uh, the evolution of the ways we campaign have been very uh, um, not beneficial to, um, 
dealing with a lot of the, the societal structural problems that we have that are complex, that have um, interdisciplinary roots, um, and it becomes too easy to scapegoat and, and to simplify these problems and reduce it to uh, just, you know, what level of coercion do you need to make these things go away, which is the kind of the order of the day in terms of Trump uh, or Bolsonaro in Brazil or Duterte in the Philippines or Putin in Russia or Erdogan in, 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 in Turkey, you name it. You know, like these right wingers, simple question of we just need more coercion. We'll make this go away. China has <laughs> really developed on that, that aspect. The new laws in Hong Kong are just insane. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not a world that I think any of us want to live in. Um, so, yes, it can be different if we uh, evolve new ways to approach this problem. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, um, this, this idea of a, of a straw poll. Um, let's say uh, you go to the House of Representatives um, five years ago, not, not, not today so much, but five years ago, and ask a uh, show of hands, how many of you want to see uh, marijuana legalized and regulated uh, like, it, like it is uh, at that time in, in Colorado and Washington State? Um, maybe you'll get uh, two dozen back then to raise their hands, um, but if you gave them a, a veil of anonymity, um, if you gave them uh, a, a, a temporary secret vote, um, a non-binding one, very important. We don't make laws in secret and we shouldn't. But to get a sense of, of the body, uh, of Congress as a whole, what if you um, had a non-binding straw poll, a survey? Would you support this uh, without, and, and for, as a procedural exercise only, not as a way of making law, but as, as an exercise to help break a false consensus uh, for, for that five or 10 minute exercise, no one will know how you voted, right? They won't know, uh, your spouse won't know, your staff won't know, your party leadership, uh, party whips won't know, your funders won't know, your constituents won't know. It is simply between you and your conscience. Do you believe that continued marijuana prohibition is good for our society? Uh, or would you rather see a regulatory model uh, put in? Then I think you would get a much higher uh, percentage of, of Congress, even five years ago. Uh, probably a majority to come out in favor of this. Um, and what that does is it, it breaks the ice, right? So that it allows people then to have a more meaningful conversation uh, without thinking that the only ones in the room um, uh, who, who share these views, right? It's like going to a, a, a convention on, uh, of closeted gay Mormons, right? They're terrified to speak out because they think they're the only one in the room when in fact they're the majority in the room. Um, anyway, that's a way to break a false consensus and that gives them uh, a, 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 once the, the results of that anonymous straw poll are, 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 are released, that it turns out two thirds of the legislative body is in favor of this, then it gives them uh, uh, some cover, all right? Uh, it lets them take the, the courageous way out, even though it's a coward's way out, I'll, I'll let them call themselves courageous, but it allows them to say, look, I'm really saying, standing up and, and saying in public what most of my colleagues already believe in private, that prohibition has failed, we need to look at regulation. Uh, and so let's get on with this. You could, do, you could apply that same technique to instance, for instance, to uh, uh, different bodies uh, uh, at, the, at the state or municipal level. Great thing to try out in, in, in town councils uh, on, on controversial third rail political issues, uh, uh, you know, anonymous straw poll. You could do it at, at conventions of um, chiefs of police, for instance, right? A lot of the chiefs of police have been there a long time and they understand how, how failed the drug war is, but they're afraid to speak out because there'll be Professional costs, perhaps, for them. But if they realize suddenly they're actually the majority, that changes the conversation and can jumpstart a debate that might otherwise take decades or generations to percolate up to the surface where people feel comfortable to talk about them. Um, oops, let me go back to questions. Uh, why? Um, why isn't the overt connection between these various wars on drugs more often connected? The language of uh, Duterte holds a direct parallel to language held by American presidents during the initiation of the war on drugs. Uh, how do we shift the focus from politicians to the people and the solutions addressing uh, and, and addressing and operations of long-term problems? Politicians typically come from a specific class of people who are honestly detached from the social ills uh, of the common peoples. Uh, so it's a good question. Um, why isn't the uh, connection between these war on drugs more often connected? I think uh, that quote uh, that, that I showed you from Robert F. Kennedy from 1965 uh, gets at that. 
it, it, and the same with, with Craig Reinerman. These are complicated issues that are, are uh, interrelated uh, and they need to be solved um, uh, very often uh, in, in parallel. Um, and it's not just about drugs. And so part of that is, uh, is understanding that there are politicians who can uh, voice these things, who are doing that now. Um, most of my adult life, I was waiting for the next RFK to come along, right? Uh, and we have a, a whole new crop of, of, of really exciting legislators. AOC is a great example. Uh, Katie Porter is another great example. There are lots of these, mostly women, <laughs> and very often women of color, who are the ones who are, who are doing this, all right? And so it's an exciting thing to watch. They're learning how to communicate. They're much better at it than their, their, the previous generations. They know how to adapt to this, this new medium. Uh, and so, um, it's an exciting time to, to start getting involved in that. Uh, next question. Uh, can you speak uh, on the effects of this uh, prohibitionary, uh, pro prohibitionary methods on indigenous communities in the Philippines? I cannot. Um, I haven't worked with indigenous communities much in the Philippines, uh, but uh, it, again, it's a very, very complicated uh, situation. Uh, I have colleagues, uh, some of whom are on this chat, in the Philippines who uh, could connect you uh, uh, with them. Um, but uh, I am not qualified. I don't want to uh, get into that uh, and, and uh, talk about uh, things that uh, I don't have direct experience uh, with and, and should not be pontificating about. But uh, follow, um, there's a good organiz great organization in Manila called No Box uh, Transitions. Uh, uh, look them up on, on Twitter uh, and follow them. Um, on Facebook, I think they're much more active on Facebook. Uh, so that would be a great way to, to, uh, to learn more about this. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, indigenous communities around the world, that's more, uh, I think, uh, I can generalize much more about that. And I think I've talked about uh, some of that. But uh, a lot of these indigenous communities, by the way, have had access to very, very powerful drugs, uh, uh, hallucinogenic drugs that, uh, uh, you know, that, that our ancestors had access to these things and used them quite uh, uh, ritually uh, for a very long, for thousands of years. You can go back to prehistory um, and look at different societies around the world. They used mushrooms, they used different cacti, they used different plants to produce some very powerful uh, psychedelic effects, but they used them in ways that were uh, uh, or betel nut uh, or other things, yes, but that, that uh, were often used to, to um, in ritual. So they used sacred control where a shaman would use this uh, and there's no history of abuse. You know, it's only when you get to the West where we take these things out of their, their, their historic context, isolate the compounds and turn these things into a party drug. Um, I mean, it can be useful in many ways, but on the other hand, it really disrespects the indigenous wisdom and knowledge that these people have used for thousands of years and have adapted. Uh, it is very sophisticated chemistry. If you talk about, for instance, ayahuasca uh, in the Amazon regions, uh, how, how they concocted that required to this day, people are still puzzling how, how they did that because it was pretty sophisticated chemistry involved. Um, but anyway, I think um, we need to respect indigenous cultures and their wisdom and their plant wisdom, right? Uh, these things were used ritually and, and they used sacred control rather than criminal justice control, rather than different uh, other models of control. And they don't have histories of problematic use the way we do in the West. Um, and I think that needs, needs to be respected. It's also a, a, a form of mental health. This is a way of, 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 of finding harmony in your mind uh, relative to your community, relative to your environment, uh, as a way to step out of your body and look at your life. And, 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 and uh, it can lead to a lot of breakthroughs for people. People keep going to the Amazon to experiment with ayahuasca for PTSD uh, here in North America. Uh, uh, and so there's a lot of interest in that. There's a lot of potential in that. Um, and uh, I think that, that uh, these, these kinds of, of sacred controls uh, are, are something to look at. Um, anyway, uh, I hope that addresses some of those questions. Um, let's see what else is here. Any questions? So I think that's it for the for Q&A part of things. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, tuning in uh, at this long and somewhat rambling talk. I hope it made sense. I'd love to hear some feedback. Um, if you're on Twitter, follow me. Uh, my, my handle is at Sanho Tree. 
um, and shoot me some feedback or questions. I'll try to engage uh, more, uh, more online. Um, you can also email me through the website, etc. Uh, but uh, thank you all for, for tuning in, and uh, I hope this has been um, instructive or, yeah. or, or beneficial. Yeah, thank uh, you, Sano. Thank you, and and there are, well, and you can also put comments in the chat. We appreciate that. We'll have it. Um, I actually was posting things to everyone. I didn't realize I was only posting to panelists, so everyone didn't see what I was posting until then. Ah. But now I just put I put um, one. I was thanking Doug for his comments, uh, thanking you and IPS for the webinar. But also in it, I put the um, the link for the rest of the webinars, and they are. Uh, you have to register for them. Registration is required. Hopefully you can help us spread the word about the remaining webinars. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the, the remaining ones just reiterated for, uh, borders and moments of crisis, power plunder in the pandemic and protest, coronavirus authoritarianism in the far right, and why we need to save the post office. A lot of people don't know what's going on with the post office thing going on. And so um, thank you for, for joining us. And um, Hope you have a safe and and productive week. Thanks everyone. Bye bye.